Bay Ridge. Welcome to another edition of After Hours. This past Sunday, we looked at the root vice of gluttony, and we saw that it's a lot more involved than we might think of. I mentioned five different ways that gluttony exhibits itself in our uh, lives. And I also mentioned on Sunday how important food is to human existence and actually in scripture and in the drama of redemption. Obviously, food's important to human existence. As I uh, briefly mentioned on Sunday, you could technically even live without clothing or housing, but you cannot live without food and drink. In short order, we would die if we did not have food and drink. So obviously, in a certain sense, there's virtually nothing more basic to human existence than food. But beyond that, food is also central in the story that is unfolding in Scripture in the drama of redemption. For example, if you think about it, right at the very beginning when God creates humanity, the first thing he tells us is to be fruitful and multiply. But the second thing that he tells us is that he has given us all the plants of the field for our food. This is reiterated again after the flood uh, when we are also told that we can have the animals of the field. So right at the beginning of humanity's history, God comments on and makes provision for food. Secondly, obviously, as we move through, we only get to Genesis chapter 3 where we're in the garden and in the story of the first temptation, the temptation at its center is food itself, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, thirdly, as we move forward and we come to the history of Israel, we see food that is constantly important in that history. It's a famine that drives them down to Egypt. As they come out and they are in the wilderness, God provides manna for Israel. But food itself is a constant source of temptation for Israel. They complain about the manna. They grumble when there's not enough water. When God provides quail, they have problems over that. It is constant in their temptations and their struggles in the wilderness, uh, this issue regarding food. Uh, when God makes covenant with Israel, the elders of Israel go up on the mountain and we're told that they eat and drink in the presence of God as covenant is being made between God and Israel. As Israel goes into the promised land, their worship was regulated by cycles of both fasting and feasting. Many of their festivals surrounded uh, the time of sowing and then the time of reaping, the time of harvest. So much of their worship centered around food. When we come to the New Testament and we see Jesus going out into the wilderness, doing what is really done, the very first temptation that Satan brings to him is regarding food. And Jesus consciously being the new Israel, succeeding where Israel has failed, quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 regarding the whole provision of manna and what God had taught them and the centrality of the Word of God and how our food is to remind us of that. Food was a major part of the struggle of the early church in the book of Acts. If you look, there are issues regarding Jews and Gentiles, the food that can be eaten, are we still under food laws? When God reveals the mission to the Gentiles that is coming up to Peter, he does it by means of a vision and going and showing that the Mosaic laws regarding food are no longer uh, there. When Paul describes heresy that's going to come to the church in the later days in 1 Timothy 4, one of the key issues that he recognizes is that they will not only forbid people to marry, but they will command people to abstain from certain kinds of food. And Paul says that that is not the way to spirituality, but in fact, we are to receive everything with thanksgiving to God and that all of it is good. You can also read in the book of Colossians where there were issues about not eating certain kinds of food, and Paul said that did not help us in our spirituality. Obviously, as well, one of the two sacraments Jesus left for the church is eating and drinking. We have bread and we have the, the cup that we partake in when we come to the Lord's table. So one of the central mysteries of our faith is built around 
food. And then finally, when we come to the very end of Scripture and you get to the very end of the book of Revelation, we see that the consummation of God's plan is described as the wedding supper of the Lamb. That in fact, there is going to be this great feast. It is described not only in Revelation, we can also see it in Isaiah chapter 26, and we read that it is a feast of the grandest form, that after all the ages of struggling, when finally everything is accomplished and sin is put aside, there is a feast beyond compare. So in all of these ways, we see how food is central, not only to just our regular physical existence, but even to the plan and outworking of the drama of redemption. So we should ask ourselves, why is there so much about food? What is God's purpose in food? Well, there are several things. First, it reminds us that we're dependent creatures. You and I must eat to live. Unlike God, we are not self-existent. Unlike God, we have needs, and those needs are brought to our mind every time our stomach grumbles, every time we feel the need for thirst. Secondly, it reminds us to be thankful for how richly God provides for us because we have this great need, but God abundantly richly provides for us as I mentioned on Sunday, out of all of the hundreds and hundreds of billions and trillions of stars and planets in the universe, we only know of one that produces food, uh, and that is planet Earth right where we are, and it produces for us abundantly. Thirdly, it's meant to remind us of our need for God and His Word. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, which Jesus quotes in the Temptation Wilderness, God tells us that He puts us through this cycle of hungering and then meeting that need to remind us that we do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Fourth, it reminds us that God is not against matter. Uh, C.S. Lewis one time quipped that God likes matter He's the one who made it. And so the fact that we have physical bodies and these physical bodies need physical food reminds us that the type of existence to which we're heading, even in the resurrection, is not a uh, bodiless, materialless existence, but rather we are always part of God's material creation because he likes it. And then finally, it reminds us of Christ's great death for us. Uh, and it will all the way through eternity. As we eat, we are reminded uh, each meal points us back to the Lord's Supper that we take together as a church, which points us to the great drama of redemption that we've been thinking and talking about as we're looking at these root vices, as we're going to be celebrating in the coming week uh, and Holy Week as we remember what Jesus has done for us. So that's just five ways that come to mind why food is so important. So each day as you sit down, don't just consume your food like a glutton. Take the time to think through what God intends for it to teach you and me. I hope everyone is having a great week. I look forward to us gathering this weekend for worship as we conclude our series on the root vices. God bless. Have a great week.